Chapter Four of Captain's Courageous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Captain's Courageous by Rudyard Kipling. Chapter Four. Harvey waked to find the first half at breakfast, the forecastle door drawn to a crack, and every square inch of the schooner singing its own tune. The black bulk of the cook balanced behind the tiny galley, over the glare of the stove, and the pots and pans and the pierced wooden board before it jarred and racketed to each plunge. Up and up the forecastle climbed, yearning and surging and quivering, and then, with a clear, sickle-like swoop, came down into the seas. He could hear the flaring bows cut and squelch, and there was a pause ere the divided waters came down on the deck above, like a volley of buckshot. Followed the woolly sound of the cable in the hawse hole, a grunt and squeal of the windlass, a yaw, a punt, and a kick, and the weir here gathered herself together to repeat the motions. "'Now ashore,' he heard Long Jack saying, "'ye have chores, and ye must do them in any weather. Here we're well clear of the fleet, and we've no chores, and that's a blessin'. Good night, all." He passed like a big snake from the table to his bunk, and began to smoke. Tom Platt followed his example. Uncle Salters, with pen, fought his way up the ladder to stand his watch, and the cook set for the second half. It came out of its bunks as the others had entered theirs, with a shake and a yawn. It ate till it could eat no more and then Manuel filled his pipe with some terrible tobacco, crouched himself between the pall post and a forward bunk, cocked his feet up on the table, and smiled tender and indolent smiles at the smoke. Dan lay at length in his bunk, wrestling with a gaudy, gilt-stopped accordion, whose tunes went up and down with the pitching of the weir here. The cook, his shoulders against the locker where he kept the fried pies, Dan was fond of fried pies, peeled potatoes, with one eye on the stove in event of too much water finding its way down the pipe, and the general smell and smother were past all description. Harvey considered affairs, wondered that he was not deathly sick, and crawled into his bunk again, as the softest and safest place, while Dan struck up, I don't want to play in your yard, as accurately as the wild jerks allowed. How long is this for? Harvey asked of Manuel. "'Till she get a little quiet, and we can roll to trawl. Perhaps to-night. Perhaps two days more. You do not like, eh, what?' "'I should have been crazy sick a week ago, but it doesn't seem to upset me now, much.' "'That is because we make you a fisherman, these days. If I was you, when I come to Gloucester I would give two three big candles for my good luck. Give who? To be sure, the Virgin of our church on the hill. She is very good to fishermen all the time. That is why so few of us Portuguese men ever are drowned. You are a Roman Catholic, then? I am a Madeira man. I am not a Puerto Rico boy. Shall I be Baptist, then? <laughs> eh, what? <laughs> I always give candles. Two? Three more when I come to Gloucester. The good virgin, she never forgets me, Manuel." "'I don't sense it that way,' Tom Platt put in from his bunk, his scarred face lit up by the glare of a match as he sucked at his pipe. "'It stands to reason the sea's the sea, and you'll get just about what's going, candles or kerosene, for that matter.' "'Tis a mighty good thing,' said Long Jack, "'to have a friend at court, though. I'm a man well as we are thinking. About ten years back I was crew to a South Boston market boat. We was off Minot's Ledge with a northeaster, but first atop of us, thicker in Burgu. The old man was drunk, his chin was wagging on the tiller, and I says to myself, if ever I stick my boat hook into T Wharf again, I'll show the saints what matter of craft they save me out of. Now I'm here, as ye can well see and the model of the dirty old Kathleen, that took me a month to make, I give it to the priest, and he hung it up up forinst the altar. There's more sense in giving a model this by way of being a work of art than any candle. 
ye can buy candles at store, but a model shows the good saints ye've took trouble and are grateful. Do you believe that, Irish? said Tom Platt, turning on his elbow. Would I do it if I did not, Ohio? Well, Enoch Fuller, he made a model of the old Ohio, and she's to Salem Museum now. Mighty pretty model, too, but I guess Enoch he never done it for no sacrifice. And the way I take it is... There were the makings of an hour-long discussion of the kind that fishermen love, where the talk runs in shouting circles and no one proves anything at the end, had not Dan struck up this cheerful rhyme. Up jumped the macro with his striped back, reef in the mainsail and haul on the tack, for it's windy weather. Here Long Jack joined in. And it's blowy weather, when the winds begin to blow, pipe all hands together. Dan went on, with a cautious look at Tom Platt, holding the accordion low in the bunk. Up jumped the cod with his chuckle head, went to the main chains to heave at the lead, for it's windy weather, etc. Tom Platt seemed to be hunting for something. Dan crouched lower, but sang louder. Up jumped the flounder that swims to the ground, chuckle head, chuckle head, mind where you sound. Tom Platt's huge rubber boot whirred across the forecastle and caught Dan's uplifted arm. There was war between the man and the boy ever since Dan had discovered that the mere whistling of that tune would make him angry as he heaved the lead. "'Thought I'd fetch you,' said Dan, returning the gift with precision. "'If you don't like my music, get out your fiddle. I ain't going to lie here all day and listen to you and Long Jack arguing about candles. Fiddle, Tom Platt, or I'll learn Harve hear the tune.' Tom Platt leaned down to a locker and brought up an old white fiddle. Manuel's eye glistened, and from somewhere behind the pall post he drew out a tiny guitar-like thing with wire strings, which he called a natchette. "'Tis a concert,' said Long Jack, beaming through the smoke. "'A regular Boston concert!' There was a burst of spray as the hatch opened, and Disco in yellow oilskins descended. "'You're just in time, Disco. What's she doing outside?' "'Just this.' He dropped on to the lockers with the push and heave of the we're here. "'We're singing to keep our breakfast down. you lead, of course, Disco,' said Long Jack. "'Guess there ain't more than about two old songs I know, and you've heard em both.' His excuses were cut short by Tom Platt launching into a most dolorous tune, like unto the moaning of winds and the creaking of masts. With his eyes fixed on the beams above, Disco began this ancient, ancient ditty, Tom Platt flourishing all around him to make the tune and words fit a little. There is a crack packet, crack packet of fame. She hails from New York, and the dreadnoughts her name. You may talk of your flyers, swallowtail and black ball, but the dreadnoughts the packet that can beat them all. Now the dreadnought she lies in the river Mercy, because of the tugboat to take her to sea. But when she's off soundings, you shortly will know. Chorus. She's the Liverpool packet. Oh, Lord, let her go. Now the dreadnought she's howling crossed the banks of Newfoundland, where the water's all shallow and the bottom's all sand, says all the little fishes that swim to and fro. Chorus. She's the Liverpool packet. Oh, Lord, let her go. There were scores of verses, for he worked the dreadnought every mile of the way between Liverpool and New York as conscientiously as though he were on her deck, and the accordion pumped and the fiddle squeaked beside him. Tom Platt followed with something about the rough and tough McGinn who would pilot the vessel in. Then they called on Harvey, who felt very flattered, to contribute to the entertainment, but all that he could remember were some pieces of Skipper Ireson's Ride that he had been taught at the camp school in the Adirondacks. It seemed that they might be appropriate to the time and place, but he had no more than mentioned the title when Disco brought down one foot with a bang, and cried, "'Don't go on, young feller. That's a mistaken judgment. One of the worst kind, too, because it's catching to the ear.' "'I order have warned you,' said Dan. "'That allus fetches Dad.' "'What's wrong?' said Harvey, surprised and a little angry. "'All you're going to say,' said Disco. 
all dead wrong from start to finish, and Whittier he's to blame. I have no special call to write any Marblehead man, but twarn't no fault of Irison's. My father he told me the tale time and again, and this is the way it was. For the one hundredth time, put in Long Jack under his breath. Ben Ireson, he was skipper of the Betty, young feller, coming home from the banks. That was before the War of 1812, but justice is justice at all times. They found the active of Portland, and Gibbons of that town, he was her skipper. They found her leaking off Cape Cod Light. There was a terrible gale on, and they was getting the Betty home as fast as they could crowd her. Well, Ireson, he said there warn't any sense to reskin a boat in that sea. The men, they wouldn't have it, and he laid it before them to stay by the active till the sea run down a piece. They wouldn't have that either, hanging round the cape in any such weather, leak or no leak. They just up stays and quit, naturally taking Ireson with them. Folks to Marblehead was mad at him not running the risk, and because next day, when the sea was calm, they never stopped to think of that. Some of the act as folk was took off by a Truro man. They come into Marblehead with their own tale to tell, saying how Ireson had shamed his town, and so forth and so on. And Ireson's men, they was scared, seeing public feeling agin em. And they went back on Ireson, and swore he was responsible for the hull act. Twarn't the women neither that tarred and feathered him. Marblehead women don't act that way. "'Twas a passel of men and boys, and they carted him around town in an old dory till the bottom fell out, and Iris and he told them they'd be sorry for it some day. Well, the facts come out later, same as they usually do, too late to be any ways useful to an honest man, and Whittier, he come along and picked up the slack end of a lion tail, and tarred and feathered Ben Ireson all over once more after he was dead. "'Twas the only time Whittier ever slipped up, and twarn't fair. I wailed Dan good when he brought that piece back from school. Tots don't know no better, of course, but I'd give you the facts, hereafter and evermore to be remembered. Ben Ireson weren't no such kind of man as Whittier makes him out. My father, he knew him well, before and after that business, and you beware of hasty judgments, young feller. Next!' Harvey had never heard Disco talk so long, and collapsed with burning cheeks. But, as Dan said promptly, a boy could only learn what he was taught at school, and life was too short to keep track of every lie along the coast. Then Manuel touched the jangling, jarring little Natchette to a queer tune, and sang something in Portuguese about Nina Innocente, ending with a full-handed sweep that brought the song up with a jerk. Then Disco obliged with his second song, to an old-fashioned creaky tune, and all joined in the chorus. This is one stanza. Now April is over, and melted the snow, and out of New Bedford we shortly must tow. Yes, out of New Bedford we shortly must clear, were the whalers that never see wheat in the air. Here the fiddle went very softly for a while by itself, and then— Wheat in the ear, my true love's posy blowin'. Wheat in the ear, we're goin' off to sea. Wheat in the ear, I left you fit for sowin'. When I come back a loaf of bread you'll be. That made Harvey almost weep, though he could not tell why. But it was much worse when the cook dropped the potatoes and held out his hands for the fiddle. Still leaning against the locker door, he struck into a tune that was like something very bad but sure to happen whatever you did. After a little he sang in an unknown tongue, his big chin down on the fiddle-tail, his white eyeballs glaring in the lamplight. Harvey swung out of his bunk to hear better, and amid the straining of the timbers and the wash of the waters, the tune crooned and moaned on, like lee surf in a blind fog, till it ended with a wail. "'Jimmy Christmas! That gives me the blue creevies said Dan. "'What in thunder is it?' "'The song of Finn McCool,' said the cook, "'when he was going to Norway.' His English was not thick, but all clear-cut as though it came from a phonograph. "'Faith, I've been to Norway, but I didn't make that unwholesome noise. "'Tis like some of the old songs, though.' 
said Long Jack, sighing. "'Don't let's have another without something between,' said Dan, and the accordion struck up a rattling, catchy tune that ended. "'It's six and twenty Sundays since last we saw the land with fifteen hundred quintal, and fifteen hundred quintal, teen hundred top and quintal, twixt old Quiru and Grand.' "'Hold on!' roared Tom Platt. "'Do you want to nail the trip, Dan? That's Jonah, sure, lest you sing it after all our salt's wet.' "'No, taint. Is it, Dad? Not unless you sing the very last verse. You can't learn me anything on Jonah's.' "'What's that?' said Harvey. "'What's a Jonah?' "'A Jonah's anything that spoils the luck. Sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a boy, or a bucket.' I've known a splittin' knife Jonah two trips till we was on to her," said Tom Platt. There's all sorts of Jonas. Jim Bork was one till he was drowned on George's. I'd never ship with Jim Bork, not if I was starvin'. There was a green dory on the Ezra Flood. That was a Jonah too, the worst sort of Jonah. Drowned four men, she did, and used to shine fiery of nights in the nest. And you believe that? said Harvey, remembering what Tom Platt had said about candles and models. "'Haven't we all got to take what's served?' A mutter of dissent ran around the bunks. "'Outboard, yes. Inboard, things can happen,' said Disco. "'Don't you go making a mock of Jonah's, young feller.' "'Well, Harve ain't no Jonah. Day after we catched him,' Dan cut in, "'we had a topping good catch.' The cook threw up his head and laughed suddenly, a queer, thin laugh. He was a most disconcerting nigger. "'Murder,' said Long Jack. "'Don't do that again, doctor. We ain't used to it.' "'What's wrong?' said Dan. "'Ain't he our mascot? And didn't they strike on good after we'd struck him?' "'Oh, yes,' said the cook. "'I know that, but the catch is not finished yet.' "'He ain't going to do us any harm.' said Dan hotly. Where are you hintin' and edgin' to? He's all right. No harm, no. But one day he will be your master, Danny. That all, said Dan placidly. He won't, not by a jugful. Master, said the cook, pointing to Harvey. Man, and he pointed to Dan. That's news. How soon? said Dan with a laugh. In some years, and I shall see it. Master and man, man and master. How in thunder did you work that out? said Tom Platt. In my head, where I can see. How? This from all the others at once. I do not know, but so it will be. He dropped his head and went on peeling the potatoes, and not another word could they get out of him. Well, said Dan. A heap of things will have to come about for Harve's any master of mine, but I'm glad the doctor ain't choosin' to mark him for a Jonah. Now I mistrust Uncle Salters for the Jonerous Jonah and the fleet regardin' his own special luck. Dunno if it's spreadin' the same as smallpox. He ought to be on the Carrie Pitman. That boat's her own Jonah, sure. Crews and gear make no differ to her driftin'. Jimmy Christmas! She'll etch loose in a flat calm. "'Well, we'll clear of the fleet, anyway,' said Disco. "'Carry Pittman and all.' There was a rapping on the deck. "'Uncle Salters has catched his luck,' said Dan, as his father departed. "'It's blown clear,' Disco cried, and all the forecastle tumbled up for a bit of fresh air. The fog had gone, but a sullen sea ran in great rollers behind it. The weir here slid, as it were, into long, sunk avenues and ditches which felt quite sheltered and homelike if they would only stay still, but they changed without rest or mercy, and flung up the schooner to crown one peak of a thousand grey hills, while the wind hooted through her rigging as she zigzagged down the slopes. Far away a sea would burst in a sheet of foam, and the others would follow suit as at a signal, till Harvey's eyes swam with a vision of interlacing whites and greys. Four or five Mother Carey's chickens stormed round in circles, shrieking as they swept past the boughs. A rain-squall or two strayed aimlessly over the hopeless waste, ran downwind and back again, and melted away. 
"'Seems to me I saw something flicker just now over yonder,' said Uncle Salters, pointing to the northeast. "'Can't be any of the fleet,' said Disco, peering under his eyebrows, a hand on the forecastle gangway as the solid bows hatcheted into the troughs. "'Seas oilin' over dreadful fast. Danny, don't you want to skip up a piece and see how our trawl buoy lays?' Danny, in his big boots, trotted rather than climbed up the main rigging. This consumed Harvey with envy. Hitched himself around the reeling cross-trees, and let his eye rove till it caught the tiny black buoy flag on the shoulder of a mile-away swell. "'She's all right!' he hailed. "'Sail o! Dead to the northard, coming down like smoke! Schooner she be, too!' They waited another half-hour, the sky clearing in patches, with a flicker of sickly sun from time to time that made patches of olive-green water. Then a stump foremast lifted, ducked, and disappeared, to be followed on the next wave by a high stern with old-fashioned wooden snails' horn davits. The sails were red-tanned. "'Frenchman!' shouted Dan. "'No, tain't neither. Dad!' "'That's no French,' said Disco. Salters, your blame luck holds tighter than a screw in a keghead. I've eyes. It's Uncle Abishay. They can't no wise tell for sure. The head king of all Jonahs, groaned Tom Platt. Oh, Salters, Salters, why wasn't you a bed and asleep? How could I tell? said poor Salters as the schooner swung up. She might have been the very flying Dutchman, so foul, draggled, and unkempt was every rope and stick aboard. Her old-style quarter-deck was some four or five feet high, and her rigging flew knotted and tangled like weed at a wharf-end. She was running before the wind, yawing frightfully, her staysail let down to act as a sort of extra foresail, scandalized, they call it, and her foreboom guyed out over the side. Her bowsprit cocked up like an old-fashioned frigate's. Her jib-boon had been fished and spliced and nailed and clamped beyond further repair, and as she hove herself forward and sat down on her broad tail, she looked for all the world like a blowsy, frowsy, bad old woman sneering at a decent girl. "'That's Abishai,' said Salters. "'Full of gin and judic men, and the judgments of Providence laying for em and never taking good holt.' He's run in to bait, Mickelon way. He run her under, said Long Jack. That's no rig for this weather. Not he, or he'd have done it long ago, Disco replied. Looks as if he's calculated to run us under. Ain't she down by the head more natural, Tom Platt? If it's his style of loadin' her, she ain't safe, said the sailor slowly. If she spewed her oakum, he'd better get to his pumps mighty quick. The creature thrashed up, wore round with a clatter and rattle, and lay head to wind within earshot. A greybeard wagged over the bulwark, and a thick voice yelled something Harvey could not understand. But Disco's face darkened. He'd risk every stick he has to carry bad news. Says we're in for a shift of wind. He's in for worse. Abishai! Abishai! He waved his arm up and down with a gesture of a man at the pumps, and pointed forward. The crew mocked him and laughed. "'Jound she had strip ye and trip ye!' yelled Uncle Abishai. "'A livin' gale! A livin' gale! Yeah! Cast up for your last trip, all you Gloucester haddocks! You won't see Gloucester no more, no more!' "'Crazy full, as usual,' said Tom Platt. Wish he hadn't spied us, though. She drifted out of hearing while the gray head yelled something about a dance at the Bay of Bulls and a dead man in the forecastle. Harvey shuddered. He had seen the sloven tilled decks and the savage eyed crew. And that's a fine little float in hell for a draft, said Long Jack. I wonder what mischief she's been at ashore. He's a trawler, Dan explained to Harvey and he runs her for bait all along the coast. Oh, no, not home. He don't go. He deals along the south and east shore up yonder. He nodded in the direction of the pitiless Newfoundland beaches. Dad won't never take me ashore there. They're a mighty tough crowd. 
and Abishai's the toughest. You saw his boat? Well, she's nigh seventy year old, they say, the last of the old marblehead heel-tappers. They don't make them quarter-decks any more. Abishai don't use marblehead, though. He ain't wanted there. He just drifts around in debt, trawling and cussing like you've heard. Been a Jonah for years and years, he says. Gets liquor from the free camp boats for making spells and selling winds and such truck. Crazy, I guess. Twon't be any use under running the trawl tonight, said Tom Platt with quiet despair. He come alongside special to cuss us. I'd give my wage and share to see him at the gangway of the old Ohio fore we quit floggin. Just about six dozen and Sam Mokata layin' em on criss-cross. The dishevelled heel-tapper danced drunkenly downwind, and all eyes followed her. Suddenly the cook cried in his phonograph voice, "'It was his own death made him speak so. He is Fay, Fay, I tell you. Look!' She sailed into a patch of watery sunshine three or four miles distant. The patch dulled and faded out, and even as the light passed, so did the schooner. She dropped into a hollow and was not. "'Run under, by the great hawk block!' shouted Disco, jumping aft. "'Drunk or sober, we've got to help him. Heave short and break her out. Smart!' Harvey was thrown on the deck by the shock that followed the setting of the jib and foresail, for they hove short on the cable, and to save time jerked the anchor bodily from the bottom, heaving in as they moved away. This is a bit of brute force seldom resorted to except in matters of life and death, and the little we're here complained like a human. They ran down to where Abishai's craft had vanished, found two or three trawl tubs, a gin bottle, and a stove in dory. But nothing more. Let em go, said Disco, though no one had hinted at picking them up. I wouldn't have a match that belonged to Abishai aboard. Guess she run clear under. Must have been spewing her oakum for a week, and they never thought to pump her. Ah, that's one more boat gone along a leaving port all hands drunk. Glory be, said Long Jack. We'd have been obliged to help him if they were top of water thinking of that myself said tom platt fay fay said the cook rolling his eyes he has taken his own luck with him very good thing i think to tell the fleet when we see eh what said manuel if you run a that way before the wind and she work open her seams he threw out his hands with an indescribable gesture while Penn sat down on the house, and sobbed at the sheer horror and pity of it all. Harvey could not realize that he had seen death on the open waters, but he felt very sick. Then Dan went up the cross-trees, and Disco steered them back to within sight of their own trawl buoys, just before the fog blanketed the sea once again. "'We go mighty quick hereabouts when we do go,' was all he said to Harvey. "'You think on that for a spell, young feller.' That was liquor. After dinner it was calm enough to fish from the decks. Penn and Uncle Salters were very zealous this time, and the catch was large and large fish. "'Abishai surely took his luck with him,' said Salters. "'The wind ain't back nor riz nor nothin'. How about the trawl? I despise superstition anyway.' Tom Platt insisted that they had much better haul the thing and make a new berth. But the cook said, "'The luck is in two pieces. You will find it so when you look. I know.' This so tickled Long Jack that he overbore Tom Platt, and the two went out together. Underrunning a trawl means pulling it in on one side of the dory, picking off the fish, rebaiting the hooks, and passing them back to the sea again, something like pinning and unpinning linen on a wash-line. It is a lengthy business, and rather dangerous, for the long, sagging line may twitch a boat under in a flash. But when they heard, "'And now to thee, O Captain,' booming out of the fog, the crew of the We're Here took heart. The dory swirled alongside, well loaded, Tom Platt yelling for Manuel to act as relief boat. "'The luck's cut square in two pieces,' said Long Jack, forking in the fish. 
while Harvey stood open-mouthed at the skill with which the plunging dory was saved from destruction. One half was just pumpkins. Tom Platt wanted to haul her and had done with it. But I said, I'll back the doctor that has the second sight. And the other half come up sagging full of biggins. Hurry, Manny, and bring a tub of bait. There's luck afloat to-night. The fish bit at the newly baited hooks from which their brethren had just been taken, and Tom Platt and Long Jack moved methodically up and down the length of the trawl, the boat's nose surging under the wet line of hooks, stripping the sea cucumbers that they called pumpkins, slatting off the fresh-caught cod against the gunwale, rebaiting, and loading Manuel's dory till dusk. "'I'll take no risks,' said Disco, then. "'Not with him floating around so near.' Abishai won't sink for a week. Heave in the dories, and we'll dress down after supper." That was a mighty dressing down, attended by three or four blowing grampuses. It lasted till nine o'clock, and Disco was thrice heard to chuckle as Harvey pitched the split fish into the hold. "'Say, you're hauling ahead dreadful fast,' said Dan, when they ground the knives after the men had turned in. There's something of a sea to-night, and I hain't heard you made no remarks on it." "'Too busy,' Harvey replied, testing a blade's edge. "'Come to think of it, she is a high kicker.'" The little schooner was gambling all around her anchor among the silver-tipped waves. Backing with a start of affected surprise at the sight of the strained cable, she pounced on it like a kitten, while the spray of her descent burst through the hawse-holes with the report of a gun. Shaking her head, she would say, "'Well, I'm sorry I can't stay any longer with you. I'm going north,' and would sidle off, halting suddenly with a dramatic rattle of her rigging. "'And I was just going to observe,' she would begin, as gravely as a drunken man addressing a lamp-post. The rest of the sentence, she acted her words in dumb show, of course, was lost in a fit of fidgets, when she behaved like a puppy chewing a string a clumsy woman in a side-saddle, a hen with her head cut off, or a cow stung by a hornet, exactly as the whims of the sea took her. "'See her say in her piece? She's Patrick Henry now,' said Dan. She swung sideways on a roller, and gesticulated with her jib-boon from port to starboard. "'But as for me, give me liberty, or give me death!' Whop! She sat down in the moon-path on the water, curtsying with a flourish of pride impressive enough, had not the wheel-gear sniggered mockingly in its box. Harvey laughed aloud. <laughs> Why, it's just as if she was alive, he said. She's as stiddy as a house and dry as a heron, said Dan, enthusiastically, as he was stung across the deck in a batter of spray. Fends em off and fends em off, and don't you come nigh me, she says. Look at her! Just look at her! Sakes, you should see one of them toothpicks heisting up her anchor on her spike over fifteen fathom water. What's a toothpick, Dan? Them new haddockers and herring boats, fine as a yacht forward, with yacht sterns to em, and spike bowsprits, and a house that'd take our hold. I've heard that Burgess himself he made the models for three or four of em. Dad sut against em on account of their pitchin' and joltin'. But there are heaps of money in em. Dad can find fish, but he ain't no ways progressive. He don't go with the march of the times. They're chock full of labor saving jigs and such all. Ever see the Elector of Gloucester? She's a daisy, if she is a toothpick. What do they cost, Dan? Hills of dollars. Fifteen thousand, perhaps. More, maybe. There's gold leaf and everything you can think of then, to himself, half under his breath, "'Guess I'd call her Hattie S., too.'" End of chapter